Institute is, is a home away from home. Whenever I walk into Institute, I just feel so welcome. The Everyone Institute so teachers friendly. are the Institute best. Institute is a total game changer. I love our deep me. dives into gospel I doctrine. feel like I belong there. I feel connected to heaven when I attend it's Institute. It's like the scriptures come to life. We love each other. We have friendships I love that will going last to forever. Institute. I just Institute. love going to the Institute. 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 Welcome to Scripture Verse, a podcast for Latter-day Saint adults that dives deep into the Word of God with personal application and relevance. Grab your scriptures and have a prayer in your heart as we begin today's study. And now, it's time for today's episode of Scripture Verse. Friends, I am thrilled that you have uh, come to this point in our course. We're going to finish up the book of Revelation today and look at the exalted earth and uh, do a quick little review. Uh, again, this course is on preparing for the second coming. Can, please know that this topic is on the hearts and minds of our apostles and prophets. Elder Christofferson said, April 2019 General Conference, some time ago the Holy Spirit affirmed something to me in an unexpected, powerful, clear manner. It was this, it is supremely important to prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Elder Holland, uh, New Era, December 2013. We have a responsibility to prepare the church to receive the Lamb of God. No other dispensation has ever had that duty to be worthy to have Christ come and greet them. President Uchtdorf, April 2017 General Conference. Inherit in the name of our church is the commitment to look forward to the Savior's return. I had never put the name of our church together with the second coming, but it sure seems to fit. President Nelson, June 2018 devotional, every prophet has seen and talked about our day when the world would be prepared for the second coming. Our Heavenly Father has reserved many of his noble spirits, perhaps his finest team for this final phase. Those noble spirits, those finest players, those heroes are you. Oh, if that doesn't get you thrilled uh, to be living in this latter day, nothing will. Well, here's how the final scenes will play out. The devil will be loose for a short time after the millennium. Wickedness will again prevail. All mortals will be resurrected and inherit immortality. A final war between Michael and his followers and the devil and his followers will result in the expulsion of the devil forever. We'll have a separation of the righteous from the wicked. The earth will be sanctified and receive its celestial glory. Section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants talks about this final battle. Um, scripturally, it can be called the Battle of Gog and Magog. There's actually two uses of that term. One is for the Battle of Armageddon. The other is for this great and, and final battle. Section 88 says this about that final contest. And remember, we're all resurrected at this point. We're all immortal. So it's not really a, a war of uh, you know bombs and guns and things like that. It says... Then he shall be loose for the space of a little season, that he may gather together his armies. Michael, the seventh angel, even the archangel, shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of heaven. The devil shall gather together his armies, even the hosts of hell, and shall come up to battle against Michael and his armies. Then cometh the battle of the great God, the devil and his armies. They shall be cast away into their own place, and they shall not have power over the saints any more at all. One uh, question one of my students asked one time was, who's on the offensive? I never thought about this. I don't know what the answer is, but in the order of operations in, the, in these verses, Michael, uh, in verse 112 of section 88, he's the first one listed, listed as gathering armies. I'd always thought as the devil coming to attack the saints. I wonder, again, based on the nature of the battle and the war, if it's Michael gathering together all of the saints and they go to war to try and convince those that are not considering God and his plan of salvation to give them one final chance. I'd never thought about the idea of the, the good guys being on the offensive. But reading that verse in the order, uh, the proper order, it, that there could be a possibility. It was a great idea mentioned by a student, and I'll throw that out to you today. Um. During this time, the, right, the winding up scenes of the earth, um, the New Jerusalem, Zion, the city of Enoch, whatever you want to call it, will return to the earth. We learn about that in Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 11. Um, Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, he taught during this cleansing period, again, kind of this final battle, uh, the city Zion or New Jerusalem will be taken from the earth. And when the earth is prepared for the celestial glory, the city will come down according to the prediction in the book of Revelation. So they'll go back and forth a little bit. Uh, 
In chapter 21, um, verses 12 through 17, we learn about the size of the city. It says that the city is massive. In fact, it's going to be a square city, according to Revelation 21, 12 through 17. Um, how square and how long? Well, it uses the measurement of a furlong, 12,000 of them. A furlong happens to be 660 feet. If you do 660 feet times 12,000 furlongs, that works out to be 1,500 miles. <laughs> it would cover almost half of the United States in a square shape, really a cube shape going up into the other outer atmosphere. <laughs> now, I think this could be symbolic. 12 is the number for priesthood and 1,000 is the number of perfection. So maybe this, this city is a group led by priesthood power under priesthood authority. Maybe they are a group that's been perfected through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That's the only way I can explain it. We'll have to see how this one plays out. In chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, we learn uh, some conditions of what it's going to look like in these winding up scenes. It says that there's 12 gates and 12 pearls. Uh, every gate has a pearl, and the city of the gate was a pure gold. It was a transparent glass. Uh, verse 22, now I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb were the temple of it. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Why no temple? Well, God and Jesus are there. We currently go to the temple to worship them, but when they are present, we don't need a temple building. In chapter 22, verses 1, 2, and 3, we learn more details. There's a beautiful um, river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God. Uh, in the middle of the street and on either side, there's a river. There's this tree of life, which bears 12 different types of fruits. Um, verse 3, there's no more curse. The throne of God, of the Lamb, are there. The servants will serve him. You see, it's a reverse of the curse at the end, you guys. In Genesis, we have the heavens and the earth, but now we have a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis 1, we have the sun created, but now there's no more need for that sun in the book of Revelation at the end as the earth winds up. Uh, the night was established back in Genesis 1, but now there's no more night. The sea was created, but now there's no more sea. The curse was announced when Adam and Eve partook, but now that curse has been reversed. Death came into the world back in Genesis chapter 3, but now there's no more death. Uh, in Genesis 3, man was driven from the tree of life, but now man is being restored to paradise in that tree of life. Sorrow and pain were introduced after the fall back in Genesis, but now there's no more sorrow and no more pain. You see, there's a symmetry here in this whole story, not just to, from Genesis to Revelation, but the earth itself. Remember, the earth was created celestial, and then in the garden state, it was terrestrial. And then after the fall, it became telestial. During the millennium, the earth will become terrestrial once again, and ultimately it will be exalted. It kind of follows a, a plan of salvation. What will the celestial kingdom look like? We don't know specifically. We have some details here in Revelation 21 and 22. Orson Pratt, not correlated statement by the church, but he wrote this in the Millennial Star article. A saint expects to have a, seven with, uh, excuse me, a heaven with lands and houses, cities, vegetation, rivers, animals, food, raiment, musical instruments, organized into families, embracing all the relationships of husbands and wives, parents and children, where sorrow, crying, pain, death will be known no more. On it, they expect to live, eat, drink, converse, worship, sing, play on musical instruments, engaged in joyful, innocent social amusements, visiting neighboring towns and neighboring worlds. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. What a what a celestial kingdom it might be. Notice food, by the way. He talks about food twice. <laughs> I'm a foodie. I love that. Musical instruments and fun and games and, uh, and boy, your vacations. Oh, man. <laughs> neighboring towns and neighboring worlds. What a time. A few other doctrines about this uh, exalted world. Friendships will continue. That section 130 verse 2 that will have sociality up there. Um, I, I call it a housewarming gift. Section 130 verse 11 talks about how we receive a white stone that's going to become a, our own Urim and Thummim, a device where we receive information and knowledge. I picture kind of a, a, a iPhone, you know, 50.2, <laughs> an advanced uh, maybe smartphone called a Yerman Thummim that uh, has knowledge in it. 
Um, we can visit people in lower kingdoms. We talked about that in our last class from section 76. We may not need words to communicate. Orson Pratt said that communication in heaven isn't dependent upon sound waves and, and auditory nerves in our ears. Instead, we might communicate mind to mind or spirit to spirit. We might just get each other without needing to use words. He also taught that we will learn 10,000 times faster. You know, instead of uh, right now, we think in, in one channel. Up there, as we're exalted, knowledge will come in like the light, he said, informing the spirit, really spirit to spirit learning. And he says 10,000 things at the same time. The mind will be capable of receiving and retaining all of it. And those statements are from Journal of Discourses, Volume 2. When all is said and done, when all is said and done, Brigham Young taught, the earth will abide its creation and will ultimately roll back into the presence of God who formed it and abide there forever and ever. And that statement was requoted in our March 2003 Inside Magazine. And then Elder McConkie concludes, the cycle will begin again. Exalted parents are to their children as our eternal parents are to us. Eternal increase, a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. New earths are created, and thus the on-rolling purposes of the gods of heaven go forward from eternity to eternity. We receive all that God has and become like him in our heavenly parents. You guys, we're at the end. I want to end with one uh, one last passage. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 is a verse used by some of our adversaries. It talks about here where if any man that heareth these words of the prophecies of this book, if they shall add unto these things, God will add unto them the plagues that are in this book. If you take away God will anything from this book, God will take them away from the book of life. <laughs> you have to know, and you probably know this, but the book of Revelation was written before several other New Testament books. <laughs> it was written before Second Thessalonians and First Timothy and Titus and John and Second Peter and Jude. So this this statement here in the end of Revelation is specific to the book of Revelation, not the Bible itself. Not the Bible, just specifically the book of Revelation. And that's true. We know this and we support this. Nephi almost wrote down what John saw in the book of Revelation. The angel said, whoa, Nephi, don't write that down. That is for John. Uh, it sounds like the Nephi that Nephi and that angel were familiar with Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Oh, our last verses, Revelation 22, verse 20. He which testifieth of these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You see... Roger Ingersoll, he was the great agnostic back in the 1800s. He called the book of Revelation the insanest of all books. Thomas Jefferson, um, he said that the book of Revelation was merely the ravings of a maniac, no more worthy nor capable of explanation than the incoherencies of our own nightly dreams. <laughs> Martin Luther, that great reformer from the 1500s, he said the book of Revelation is an offensive piece of work, neither apostolic nor prophetic. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. <laughs> the prophet Joseph Smith said, Revel book of Revelation is one of the plainest books that God ever caused to be written. <laughs> I love it. Thank we thank thee, O God, for a prophet. Brothers and sisters, that concludes our course on preparing for the second coming. I thank you for your valiancy. I admonish you to prepare. He's coming. As you sit down with your leaders, as you talk, uh, Temple recommend questions, I testify those are dress rehearsals for that final judgment. If you can answer appropriately to those Temple recommend questions, I testify that you will be prepared for that moment. I testify that if you're making celestial decisions and choices, that you will be in the celestial kingdom. If you're a good, honorable person, but you're not interested in those celestial things, I testify you will probably line, wind up in that terrestrial kingdom. But no matter where you or I wind up, I think we will testify of the goodness of God in that moment, that his judgment is perfect.
I hope you are prepared. I would love nothing more for us to get together in that celestial kingdom and just reminisce and look back and watch, maybe review the book of Revelation and just see exactly how things played out against John's uh, writing of his prophecy. And you might even say, brother, oh, you missed that one. Oh, remember this slide when you said this and that? And I say, I'll say, yep, you're right. Oh, I tried my best to use prophetic commentary in the, in the words of, of prophets in scripture. And I, I got that wrong. <laughs> But I do testify of one thing, and that is Jesus, his love, his kindness, his mercy, and his beautiful atonement. I testify that you can change, that you can become better and prepared. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of Scripture Verse. It's never been easier to take an institute class. We invite you to share this message with friends who are seeking deeper conversion and a sense of belonging. And did you know you can earn Institute credit by listening to this podcast? Just email loganinstitute at churchofjesuschrist.org. The purpose of Institute is to help young adults understand and rely on the teachings and atonement of Jesus Christ, qualify for the blessings of the temple, and prepare themselves, their families, and others for eternal life with their Father in heaven. This podcast is not affiliated nor endorsed by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.